Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. And today we are partnering up with the Alliance of Women Directors for a special spotlight that takes a look at insurance during the time of COVID. I'd like to invite uh, my co-host uh, from Alliance of Women Directors, uh, Legeria Davis, who is the co-chair of the Career Advancement Program. Hey, Legeria. Hi, hi. Um, I'm Legeria Davis, and I'm on the executive board of the Alliance of Women Directors, um, a nonprofit organization focused on expanding narratives in film, television, and new media by amplifying and advocating for women directors. So today we have a very impressive a group of panelists, a group of experts in the area of finance, uh, insurance, uh, completion bonds, and uh, production. So we're gonna get started. I'm gonna introduce you to them. We're gonna start off with to my left, Anthony Paul, uh, who is a financial expert. Um, Fred Milston, who is our completion bond expert. And Brian Kingman, who is will speak on behalf of insurance and, and all of those things. And also Cass uh, Beatles, who is an independent producer. So welcome you guys and girls. Thank you. <laughs> so let's start off. I mean, you know, right now during COVID, it's a difficult time. Uh, productions are in crisis mode as they uh, find out that they can't get insurance. So let's start off with what's going on and let's move our way towards how we find a solution. Cass, I know you just recently finished a production yeah. right in the middle of COVID. I mean, tell us, how were you able to do that? Well, it, we were supposed to shoot in March. So we did put off um, and we ended up shooting in August. So the production that would have been much larger um, that would have shot in Atlanta in August ended up being a crew of about half the size. And we shot in a very small town in Barnesville, Georgia, where we were able, able to quarantine our crew. So, you know, obviously there were some adjustments that I had to go back to the group of investors as an independent producer. You never really want to do that. However, once we reconfigured the budget, it added to about thirty-five to $40,000 to our budget. And it was a smaller movie, so it was made for a little less than a million dollars. Um, so we were, I think we were talking earlier that the PPE is adding anywhere between 10 to 15%, like on us on the independent side, about eight to 10% to your budget. So that was the first hurdle. Um, and once we realized, you know, we weren't going to be able to have the staff that we needed, not only because of budget and or crew we needed um, because of having to quarantine everybody um, and people having to be distance on set. Now you have to kind of reconfigure your crew where people are doing two or three things where normally we would have had, you know, a makeup department, we had a makeup artist. <laughs> She's in a small trailer. She can't have another makeup artist right next to her. So it's really just scaling down a crew. And I think that's a little bit easier for the independent filmmaker as opposed to huge productions. So that's a glimmer of hope. But that was kind of the very first thing we started. Outside of that, you know, I mean, small things that, that's, well, things that seem small that when you get into production aren't. You know, everyone had to have their cars. You can't have a van. So we can't load everyone in the van and take them to the van. You know, it was like, we had to add a little mileage because everybody had to drive their car to set. We had to find places for their car. So you really have to start itemizing all of your line items. Um, and we got it done. Um, it was a 14 day shoot. Um, and, you know, we managed to get it done COVID free. We had a medic on set, um, you know, SAG came and approved everything. We had tests for the A group every two days and the A group is anybody that's in contact with people on set. Um, so the only group that we really found that wasn't the A group were the set designers and the people who came ahead of time and we had to make sure they left and you know went away. Um, where you normally can rent maybe like someone's house, now you have to make sure the house is clean, it's empty, it's available, it's you know vacant, it's been quarantined. Um, so just thinking ahead um, and, and allowing that time to kind of COVID safety each line item um, was really how we got through it. So you have to scrub each line item. Each, each line item. You really had to think about, okay, how is this going to, how, how are we affected here? How are we affected here? And that was just, you know, even once we got down there, it's like, okay, how are we eating? You know, what are we, 
we, we obviously had to have everything individually wrapped, but you know, normally you have breakfast. Well, now we had to provide that for every person individually wrapped and into, you know, and those, those things add up. It sounds small, but next thing you know, you know, you've got an additional 10 grand in catering. Right. And um, Cass, I'm curious because um, if you have not a makeup department or a hair department and a costume department and you have one, how does that, and you said 14 days. Yeah. So, I mean, you made your days. Did that slow you down in any kind of way? Only have one person working on one person at a time? Like how- It was you- originally going to be a 12 day shoot. Oh, okay. <laughs> we were trying to get it. It was, a, it was a thriller horror. So we were like, okay, we've got limited location. Um, but it did. I mean, again, we had to reschedule things um, because we just didn't have the crew to support the the the, the film. Essentially, um, you have to have a bunch of multi hyphenates. Which you know, the great thing about independent filmmaking, a lot of us have come up through the ranks, so you are used to doing several things. But just kind of restructuring that crew so that if I have a my lead gaffer, you know, my best boy is also my electric, is also my this. Okay, we got one guy handle in that department. But that does slow down your day and your time and you're not able to shoot your pages. Um, but if you do not plan that ahead of time, you will find that you get yourself into a, a big ball of trouble. And I have heard a lot of independent filmmakers that um, even a few that have tried to start that have gotten shut down because, you know, the unions are going to come to set now. You know, everyone's on your radar now. If you were able to kind of skirt around it. There is none of that. Um, you know, we have to make sure people are safe. Um, also, we had to adjust the script because you have to check with your talent. So we had some scenes that we weren't able to shoot. We had to kind of restructure those scenes so that the talent um, wasn't kissing or the talent wasn't, you know, up on each other. And, and being very mindful of that if you've already cast or before you cast to make sure now, you know, does, is everyone still okay with the script? And that's aside testing and everything else. People, some people still are, you know, they don't want to have that contact. So I have, to, I have to say, I, I'm a completion guarantor and we see lots of productions. First of all, congratulations for getting through the production, um, at what, you know, infection free. Yes. Um, but ex- it sounds exactly like you've hit every single note that productions we see large and small have to take into consideration when they're planning the next picture in this environment. Yeah. You know, adding more days, yep. um, having time to do that, um, having hidden costs that you wouldn't normally think twice about. We have a show actually that started shooting yesterday that Brian and I are working on together where they have extras. They don't have a lot of extras, but they have extras. And they're shooting here in Los Angeles. Well, normally you pay, I don't know, 200 or 250, you know, whatever it is for an extra, except they can't go home. Right. They have to be in a bubble. So now you have to put them up in an environment where you've cleaned and scrubbed. So the $250 extra is now $650 a day. Our crew, became our, hmm? our crew became our extras. Our crew became our extras. That was something I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But yeah. there are a lot of these hidden costs aside from just the actual cost of PPE, the actual cost of testing, you know, that you would normally think about. There are a lot of these additional costs that have to be considered, um, you know, in, in this environment, unfortunately. It, it, but it absolutely sounds like you, you went through the process and you really did think about these things and were able to accomplish it. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kaz, I've got a question. And, um, I'm Brian Kingman. I'm, I'm an insurance broker um, and I insure the business of entertainment, more specifically film. Right. Uh, did you have, uh, how did you procure your insurance and did you have COVID insurance on your, on your movie? We, we got our regular production insurance, we did not have COVID insurance. Our, de- our insurance definitely stated that if there was any COVID related claim that they would not be covered. It, we would not have any coverage on that. And that's a huge thing. We actually the, we had to end up changing our DP because of it. Um, yeah, they, 
I didn't have it. We didn't have it. And even then, well, again, we shot at the very top of August when things were just starting to get cranked up again. And there were, it's like, there really weren't any rules. I remember SAG was like, well, we don't have rules, but we have rules. So we had to put together the 10 page uh, manual as to how we were going to stay safe on set because SAG hadn't released theirs yet. So, I mean, I think we got in a little sweet spot um, before people really started like shooting, shooting again. Um, but yeah, our insurance did not cover COVID, but I did take the COVID compliance officer test. And I recommend all producers do that. Um, I did it just, I didn't act as an officer, obviously, but I, I needed to know, you know, what are they gonna be looking for? Like, what are the rules? What are the things? So that then I could make sure that the medic and everybody, it's just like having those extra eyes of, okay, that's not safe. Okay, we can't do that. Or, you know, I just would tell every independent producer, go online, take the class, like get training so that you can be aware of what's going on on your set. So Fred and uh, Brian, given the circumstances, how do productions begin to pick up the pieces? Uh, as far as insurance is concerned, I wish I had some good news uh, for everybody, but but insurance for COVID is virtually unavailable. Um, there's a couple of specialty markets that are writing limited coverage, which we can talk about. Um, but I think it's important to know, you know what's happened to our industry. Firstly, um, we are one of the few industries that have insurance products, specialty insurance products normally, right? Pre-COVID that actually um, provide coverage for uh, actor incapacity because of contracting COVID. So in the event they get sick, uh, production gets stopped or, or worse, um, or, or action of a civil authority that prohibits the, the movie from, from proceeding uh, you know, into their schedule and completing. Uh, we also have imminent peril coverages and, 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 and other coverages that do not uh, exclude and actually provide affirmative coverage uh, for COVID, full stop. That's, that's the good news. So if anybody procured insurance prior to say March 15th of this year, they have the necessary insurance um, you know, to, 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 to cover COVID um, or at least a lot of insurance to cover COVID. It might not be enough because of the size and scope of the, of the delays that we've all, you know, that we're all suffering through. Uh, the bad news is if you're a filmmaker and you don't have um, insurance already, or if you're a filmmaker that's running out of insurance coverage because each policy has a term of coverage, um, you, can, you can be in for some real um, serious problems when your policies either expire or if, or if you're just an independent producer trying to relaunch or, or launch a movie. Uh, insurance for COVID is virtually unavailable. And the amount of losses that this industry, the specialty boutique, industry of ensuring the business of filmed entertainment has taken tremendous uh, losses internationally. I'm, my guess is, and, 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 and many of the carriers don't even know what their losses are going to be, but my guess is somewhere between a billion and two billion dollars of losses to the film industry for which they're, they're providing insurance for. Um, so so that, how does that impact the uh, boutique insurance industry? Uh, the gross premiums written are probably about $300 million a year. And the margins on that $300 million for, you know, to cover regular losses and, and, and regular illness and regular injuries to cast members or fires or floods or other problems, um, the margins are, are probably 10% of that. The market was not healthy and they weren't making a lot of money uh, pre-COVID. So you add this, 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 this huge cloud of, of a billion to a $2 billion, somewhere in that, and there's a lot of room there. And then, and then we're not even out of the fog yet. So we've got a situation where we have a second wave and many of the productions are still covered uh, for COVID insurance. So many of the, insur the insurers are going like, you know, Brian, what is this potentially gonna cost us? We've got 1,100 productions shooting globally. Um, and, they're, and they're, re, they're rebooting. They're trying to complete their movies or they're moving forward on a new movie that had been bound you know, prior to the deadline. So, so the, the, the good news is for filmmakers that, that 
procure insurance before March is that they probably have the right kind of insurance. Uh, the bad news is any, any new filmmaker um, is going to have a terrible time uh, getting any coverage for COVID uh, full stop. Um, now, having said that, there's a couple of boutique facilities that are offering uh, COVID insurance, uh, kind of expensive. It's approximately 8 to 12 percent of the, of the budget. Uh, you've got a deductible of about 1 percent of the gross costs of the, of the production. Um, and, and yet you have some pretty good coverage there yet. It's kind of a moving target on where they'll buy coverage, uh, for your movie and how far out It's usually a 30 days, nose, 30 day nose to the coverage, which pre can present issues for certain productions. And then what was good perhaps today might not be good, you know, 35, 40 days yeah. down the road. So it's kind of a. It's a hard, it's really hard to manage that whole process. Um, and so, and so that's where we are. Fred, right, how me, do you recalibrate yeah, it? But, but, Gil, let me add, I, my parent company is one of those boutique companies, as Brian knows, that's been, uh, that's come up with COVID coverage uh, that, you know, we've been working on, uh, in, on some of these together. Um, it is expensive. That is true. It will be uh, eight to eight to 10, 11 percent of your budget for for a premium. And it obviously won't work for pictures of a certain size. It's obviously designed for medium to large size productions, but it does provide the kind of coverage you need. However, as Brian indicated, it's very limited in terms of the capacity. You know, we can't we can't crank these out the way you would normally uh, underwrite regular insurance, knowing that it's always available, knowing that if you had a need, you could get it. Um, the insurers are um, very, I, I don't want to say they were elusive, but they're extremely careful in how they declare whether a production is eligible for the coverage. Primarily because, of primarily location. I was going to get into that. Um, mm -hmm. But first, since what we're talking about is money, Anthony, so given these circumstances, how do you find the money now for, uh, how do you find the investors for uh, projects that are looking to move forward to green light? But because of these circumstances, I mean, it's gotten a lot difficult, I, I imagine. Yeah, Gil, you know, as a financial advisor um, that is a, a love for the arts in particular, you know, filmmaking as well as television, is that, you know, the, the investors that I've talked to in terms of independent uh, production have been really focused on um, smaller uh, budget projects that, you know, have a lower cast requirement, uh, the non-scripted stuff um, that have a lower chance of infection uh, from the coronavirus. So they also like the, you know, the turnaround time on that, that, you know, can go to market a little quicker. So, you know, for the conversations I've had in 2020 on the actual independent film investor side, that's what I've heard more as a central theme is what they're looking for. Um, in terms of just the overall feeling, um, now you got different time periods in, in this whole environment, right? So if we're going back to March, it was a risk off trade. You know, March, April, May, no one wanted to take any risk in, in terms of this type of profile. Mm -hmm. As things kind of opened up again, you know, you have the stimulus package come in. So I, I talked to some of the people in my network really in the beginning about, you know, what are your resources and how do you survive an, uh, the economy shutting down? Then as the federal stimulus package came out, as well as the economy started to reopen, then, you know, you talk to people about, okay, how do you operate in this new normal? So as we worked our way through, as Kaz mentioned, like, you know, the summertime, et cetera, you had more of a, a, a little bit more risk on type of uh, ability that have film investors kind of take more of a risk. Again, they look at the projects that I kind of highlighted for you for the conversations I've had. But as we head into now new uncharted territory with global cases rising, it's going to, again, you're getting back into that kind of feeling of what I'm getting kind of like back in early uh, March, April, where, you know, individual investors are kind of, kind of going, okay, let's hold on to some cash, keep our powder dry. 
Um, the other big thing leading up to where we are today, November 18th, was the election. So that was another risk profile thing that was kind of changed things a bit. But right now, you know, if I'm an independent um, uh, film producer, you have to understand the game and know that there's going to be some challenges. So anybody you're talking to, the conversation that you guys are bringing up today is going to be extremely relevant. You want to have that in your presentation deck that says, okay, and bring it up, you know, right up front. Hey, it's more challenging to get insurance. My budget, as Kaz mentioned earlier, I have to factor in, you know, this eight to 12% as uh, Fred mentioned as well, and start to have those conversations with your investors or potential investors and say, hey, this is a new challenge we have, but the opportunities are there when you start talking about the um, VOD opportunities, which we'll get to at some point, I'm sure. But I, I think going back to your question directly is that you have to meet them where they're at. You have to put it on the table because it's already in their mind, right? They're, as I said moment, a moment ago, their risk appetite has been redu greatly reduced because of the environment. Now you have to um, meet that um, obstacle uh, as far as their own um, impediment for investing in this time and say, hey, I can get insurance. It's just going to be a bigger part of my budget. And we can complete this project, but you know, I will need you to support me financially if I have an unforeseen event as well. And you can kind of model that out as well and factor that in. Now, again, the overall conversation has to be that our budget is in line and we think we can get this accomplished. And I think as a producer, you also have to highlight some of the things that Kaz just said is that like, hey, okay, we have this contingency plan. We have this thing we're looking at. If A happens, we got B ready to go and we still feel like we can land on our target date to wrap production. Now, I throw all of that out of the window if you have lockdowns, right? If you have another lockdown of the economy. And again, when you're talking to an investor, be upfront about that and say, I'm gonna do the best I possibly can, but I can't control what I can't control. So it was a bit of a long-winded answer here, but hopefully I shed some light. No, that was extremely <laughs> valuable. Uh, Fred and Brian, I mean, what are the variables uh, that govern um, one's ability that makes it, I guess, perhaps easier? I mean, is it location, domestic versus international? Is it uh, the budget threshold? I know that coming out of this, um, people were moving their productions to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, I guess spots that weren't so impacted by uh, the pandemic, but can you give us some sense if those things really matter or how much of a difference they make? Well, location matters a lot, but we're dealing with a virus. We look at, we, we have a dashboard um, a very deep dive on analytics spotted my parent company is a data analytics firm. And so this is their bread and butter. Um, but even with the, you know, epidemiologists they have on staff and the data scientists they have on staff and the modeling, deep modeling they've done, um, they really can look about 90 days in advance as to where this virus is trending. And you know, we find locations today that a month ago were not where I would want to send you to shoot. And that a month and a half from now may not be trending in the right direction. And uh, it, it, it changes constantly. So I think location is one. I think resources are another. I think, you know, the cast of film you're talking about, exteriors, smaller crew, um, starting with the script and the design of the movie, you know, the story you want to tell, doing it on a scale um, and telling it in a way that doesn't require large crowds, uh, very confined interiors, um, sequences on the subway. I mean, it, designing it so that you you maximize you 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 minimize your risk, maximize your opportunity to come out of it, you know, scot free. I think location is important, um, and managing the size of your managing the size of your production, and adequately, as we're all saying, anticipate um, the problems that you're undoubtedly going to have. Uh, and also, I, I have to say, picking your crew and your cast wisely, 
with people who are going to take the protocols seriously. I mean, what you don't want to do is show up on your third day of shooting and find a bunch of masks on the ground. You know, you, you need people who are going to be committed to being responsible and acting properly. And I think you have to vet your, your, your cast and crew to make sure these people are going to take care of themselves and their, and their colleagues, not only on set, but also behave offset. You know, I think that's, that's really critical. Brian, wouldn't you agree? It's, it's behavior. Absolutely. And I, I think, um, you know, I think that anybody would be overly optimistic to think, A, that they're, they could actually get COVID insurance in the near future. Notwithstanding Fred's facility, they're very selective. They only have so much capacity. So they really can't take on every movie. Um, so they, they, they've got limited capacity and these other facilities do as well. They're, Brian, they're accepting one in 11 shows we bring them. Yeah, yeah. And, and then it does, some of the, sometimes the product doesn't work for a particular movie that it ramps up very slowly over a sustained period of time mm -hmm. because, the, because the, the, the virus is unpredictable. Um, Boston can be good today and it can be bad in, in two weeks. Uh, same with New York City, uh, Los Angeles. These, these things are hard to predict um, in, in the future. And so, so if, the, if, you're already, if you're already rooted into Boston, you know, and, you got, and you're 45 days out, all of a sudden the insurance companies say, oh, well, you know, you, we're not gonna insure you in, in, in Boston. You gotta go to Philly. And they go, well, we've already got $3 million of seed money and commitments into Boston. <laughs> so they say, hey, that doesn't work for us. Um, so I think that, I think my advice to filmmakers would be to plan to figure out a way to self-insure the exposure. And so what does that mean? Okay, that means that you, that you have the plan A, you have the plan B, you have the plan C, and you, have, and you do all the analytics like Fred was talking about. You study your location. Your day you costs. All of the PPE stuff you can think of. Uh, the separation, the pod, the pod theory where, where each wardrobe and, and, and makeup, they don't cross pollinate and, and all the things that you guys are doing. And, and nobody's better than, than the entertainment industry and the filmmakers in being creative and finding creative solutions to adhering to all those protocols. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed. Um, and the hygiene and all that. But, but I think that the, the real challenge is to convince bankers that the risk is manageable and, and to lend on, on, on not having the insurance. And so one methodology might be to say, hey, you know, well, why don't we just put a chunk of money into the contingency and that'll be our insurance because we've done the analytics. A shutdown will cost us, likely cost us this amount of money, okay? An actor in capacity, not likely to be a death because of the demographics or the, the age group and, and, and other things, perhaps. Um, not that that's a perfect science necessarily. Um, but, but you present maybe a two week solution and, and, then you, and then you fund for that. You get your equity to say, hey, you know, we're good for a uh, million dollars or $2 million and that's how we pegged um, you know, the, what we call the maximum foreseeable loss. So we, we've got that covered bank, uh, you're good now. And, uh, and so I, I, I don't know if that works with the banks. I've had, I've had several calls with banks and because I don't, I don't see COVID um, pandemic, epidemic um, insurance being offered by the standard entertainment community anytime in the future, long-term, short-term, whatever. Because of, the, because of the losses I talked about earlier. It could be between a billion and $2 billion. And people, senior executives have lost their jobs over this issue, not managing the insurance company's balance sheets uh, to their expectations. So they're, they're just gone. Um, and we're in an insurance crisis in the entertainment business right now. Even though they're excluding the the pandemic, the COVID, the epidemic uh, exposures and perils, um, insurance costs are going way up now uh, because the carriers have suffered such losses. 
they pulled way back. And even with those restrictions, you're gonna see uh, at least doubling of the, of the cost that you have in the past. So that's something that you should, you should budget for and think and plan ahead for. Um, and, and then again, the, do the analytics and, and do the what ifs, you know, what if this happens, what if that, and then figure out somebody to take that risk because it's all about taking risk. And Fred doesn't have the capability to bond that risk. So he's gonna say, I, I, my reinsurance doesn't cover um, COVID either. My products don't cover it. So the bank's gonna say, well, geez, I'm uncomfortable with that risk. That's too big, I don't understand it. So, so I think the art of this is to convince the banks that it's managed and, and that it's funded somehow, I think. I mean, we've seen- Anthony, there you, Anthony, there you go again. As a partner at, uh, at Raymond James and also as a board member of the Denver Film Society, where's the money? So, you know, one of the things that's going to be interesting and in what uh, Brian said as well in terms of, of location, and, and sometimes they force you to change locations, is the tax credits and the incentives, right? So, yes. you know, when you're pitching it to an investor, that's a big part of the conversation to say, okay, I've thought about this. And then I'm also layering on top of that, the state or the country's uh, case numbers or what their procedures, going back to what Fred was saying about their protocols around Corona. So I think it's, it's very helpful to have that as part of your, again, your, your pitch book, right? Your investor deck to say that, okay, I've looked at this. I think this will offset or, you know, help buffer some of the costs because, you know, take a New Zealand as an example. When they first uh, were attacking it, they were on TV all the time about how great they were doing. If you were doing an international film, uh, with COVID, right? But they also, I think, had big, great incentive programs to get you to be there for production. So if you now go into the bank or an investor and you say, hey, I put some thought into this and I have a plan to help soften the blow on some of these additional costs through the insurance side, then that is a better story. So remember, wh what are you? If you? You could be a fully a producer, but if you're a producer and filmmaker, you're a storyteller. When you're trying to raise money, or trying to get insurance or trying to get a loan, it's all about the story that you put together, the yep. analytics, the data, you know, and you're painting that story to make that investor feel comfortable and that he or she is going to get a return on their investment or it's the bank's money or it's the insurance company's money. So the more you can do this heavy lifting kind of research before you even start your production and put that together is critical, especially in a time like this. And that's whether you're talking to an individual wealthy investor or you're trying to get um, a bank to finance some of your uh, production costs. Fred, sorry to cut you off earlier. Uh, please continue. No, we, we're not seeing the commercial, as Brian was suggesting, we're not seeing the commercial banks um, really participating very much. Uh, the financing we're seeing is from private investors, uh, private equity, uh, willing to take uh, a defined COVID risk, because you can do your analytics. And as Brian was suggesting, you know, this is how much a two week shutdown might cost. This is how much uh, our day cost is. We're seeing more of the financing coming from those groups. I mean, as a completion guarantor, we can still write a completion guarantee. It's the same completion guarantee we've always written. Um, however, it excludes now COVID. Now, that doesn't mean that all of the other risks associated with making a film and delivering a film on time and on budget aren't covered by the bond. Our responsibility is still to pay overages if a film goes over budget. And, and everybody knows there are a lot of other reasons than COVID films can go over budget. Those would still be covered by the bond. Um, we have an obligation to deliver the picture and make sure it's delivered on time and on budget. On time, still a, bud re a bond requirement. We build into those uh, requirements and parameters uh, a potential COVID margin, if you will, give ourselves a little bit more time than we would normally um, have to deliver the picture. Um, but all of those other risks are still covered. And, you know, to the benefit, as Brian's insurance, all the other 
perils that are normally covered under insurance are still covered. Um, we just have this issue, <laughs> a big one, obviously, about COVID, and we're all trying to find ways to mitigate uh, that risk. And I think, you know, one can, um, to a large degree, define what those risks are going to be. The one more most undefinable is civil authority. And that is the city or the state or whatever jurisdiction having a rise in COVID and saying, um, you've got to stop working. Now, films have been lucky in the sense they've been declared essential workers. So even in situations where uh, governments have shut down the economy or, or, or created curfews, et cetera, they've allowed filmmakers to continue working as long as you're working with uh, the SAG um, defined and approved protocols. Because they assume you're testing, you're sequestering, you know, you're in a bubble. And so they've allowed most filmmakers to continue working. Um, but civil authority is the big risk. If that does get shut down, you could be shut down for a, an extended period of time. Although we haven't, with, we haven't seen that happen. You know, your period of risk, the other thing, Anthony, as you were outlining, uh, in terms of preparing to make a pitch to an investor. Your period of risk is principal photography. We had, when COVID kind of hit and everything started shutting down, we were very lucky as a bond company, we had no films that were actually in production. Everything had just wrapped. We had 22 films in post. And everybody was scrambling to figure out what do we do now? How do we do post-production from home? How do we do post-production with facilities shuttered? And everyone did. And now it's almost, there was an article just uh, the other day, it's now almost second nature. And I think going to change the industry to some degree that people are going to start not necessarily having to go to a lot of these facilities. People are going to learn, have learned, how to work at home or how to work remotely. So I think that's going to positively affect the industry, but also is a way to mitigate your risk in post-production. So your period of risk is really principal photography. And if you do what, what you suggested, which is you had 14 days, your period is very short. Of, of risk. That's an important thing to explain to your financing is the period of risk is really very short. And if you, and if you can work with that and define what you think the risk profile is and what you think the risk parameters are, how much is this going to cost? What are my day costs? How much could this can potentially hit the production for? I think with a short production period, I, th I think you can pull this all together in a way that, that makes a sensible presentation to a financier. I want to yeah. add, um, just as far as independent filmmakers, a lot of our money does come from, um, not from financial institutions, they come from individual investors, um, or individual you know, financiers. And you are very correct, the pitch deck, I mean, the, thank God I'm a writer, and a producer because the stories that you have to come up with are, are great. I mean, you, it makes you delve deep. But what I can say to the independent filmmaker is because there is now a great need for content, another approach is you can possibly reach out to the networks or studios or whomever your distribution source is and possibly do some sort of co-production deal to get a pre-licensing, to get pre-licensing money to then add, so you're not going to the financier to ask for as much money. And I have found a few producers that are able to do that where normally you may not even be able to offer that. But because the, some of the streaming sources, some of these networks that are in need for content, they're more willing to say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you 350, 400, whatever you might need as a pre-licensing deal. Um, to match. So now you're not going to the investor asking for the whole amount and you couple that with the incentive. I'm in Atlanta, so we have that 30%, you know, a lot of people shoot here. Um, but even if you're thinking about shooting here, not necessarily shooting in the 
cesspool of Atlanta exactly. uh, like we did. We, sh I mean, we were an hour and a half outside of Atlanta in this small, in this town that had two hotels. That was it. There was no one, you know, and that helped our risk. So after I put everything down on the paper for our financiers and told them, this is all, these are all the things that we're going to do coupled with, you know, the, the incentive, it started to make sense for them. Um, but you have to, again, like you said, do the work ahead of time as a producer to eliminate that. And we think about things you can make. I, I joked with another producer. I said, you know, look at misery, come up with another version. Like, just like, what are the movies that have two, three stars? You know, don't stop creating and don't stop developing. Just look at it, you know, what you're creating and what you're developing. You're not doing Ocean's Eleven right now. Not in this, not in this season. Right. Well, Kaz, that's a great point. I mean, I think that's the holy grail, right, in this environment. If you can get a deal pre-production, right, with a distributor, that'll help you with your fees and associated costs, and you have locked-in distribution. So... What is that? I mean, that's that's a win, 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 right? And now, if you have to go to your financiers, right, or your independent investors, you now come in with a stronger story, right? And so it takes some of the pressure off of you as well. So you you said something else that I wanted to pick up on real quick before I hand it back to Gil is that, you know, as someone that has seen these, I love the passion of a creative. But I'm always like, yo, you're looking at this backwards. You can have the best script, the best idea, whatever. But if you don't have any money, how are you going to get it done? So think about it. If you're going to do wear both hats, you know, uh, filmmaker and producer, then you have to think like an investor thinks. Why would you put your own money in your project, <laughs> right? Start there and kind of convince yourself or don't convince yourself. And if you can't convince yourself, figure out how you can convince yourself. Then use your network as well. So you have to get people like Brian and Fred in your network. And so I'm talking to different levels. You're, it sounds like you're a little bit more advanced cast. So sorry for breaking it down this low. But if you're fresh out of whatever and you're now starting, you have to get people like Kaz, like Fred, like Brian, so you can understand how to talk the language, how, how, what to add and take out of your presentation deck to make it cleaner. Because you're also the way to think about it, independent filmmaker, is you're not the only one potentially. If this person is wealthy, they've been pitched a movie before, right? Either it worked well, which was a great experience and they'll take your call, or it was horrible, <laughs> right? And that's my other quasi frustration is that sometimes there's a wake of bodies that have just been burned by bad experiences. And then that reduces the pool for people like Kaz to come in and, and now get a production. Done. So sorry, Gil, um, but I wanted to add those two pieces. No, I wanted to ask all of you about the value of the vaccine. I mean, you can't turn on the news or the radio uh, without hearing about this uh, vaccine. So is the vaccine going to be the silver bullet that is going to return us back to Oz and make everything normal again? Brian? Sure, I'll lead off with that one. Um, as far as the avail availability of, of COVID insurance on a move for forward basis in the standard entertainment marketplace, I don't see it coming back at all. So I see it having, having little to no impact. I think it'll make these boutique market markets uh, more comfortable and uh, the spotted uh, group, um, the elite group, um, and some of these little boutiques that have popped up and they put together um, you know, their, their, their private equity and they're taking risk and they see it as an opportunity to make some money. So I do see it um, in, in, these, in these boutique operations is softening that, that market a little bit. Uh, but as far as the, the big boys, I mean, the Chubbs, the Alliance, the One Beacons, the Hiscox, the, you know, the, the big insurers that, that currently dominate this space in entertainment, I think it's. I think the the pandemic, the epidemic, the COVID, any any derivatives of that of that virus um, or similar viruses. I think it's going to be like the war exclusion in most policies moving forward. Um, now I say that you know, in other words, carriers don't cover everything. They have a standard political risk exclusion. You know, government overthrow somewhere. Or war, if war breaks out, you know, between two countries, and 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 the, you know, there's all sorts of damage and destruction. 
That's not something that most insurance policies cover. This is gonna be adopted by the entertainment industry, in my opinion, as a move forward um, status quo. And yes, I think these boutique companies will, will, will probably soften. They may, be, may have more capacity, the rates may come down, maybe, maybe a little more flexible on terms. But in the absence of, and by the way, the, 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 the federal government can step in. Um, and that's probably the only um, organization that has the enough money um, to finance, um, you know, an ultimate insurance policy for not only for the entertainment business, but for all businesses. Remember, restaurants don't have any insurance for this. You, you know, the film industry is lucky because our products have covered these exposures up until now. So, so I, I, don't, I don't see this on a move, move forward basis being, being added back into these entertainment products. Um, but unless the federal government steps in, there is a bill called PREA um, that is getting some traction in the United States. And it's uh, essentially a, you know, a, a trillion dollar bill. Um, it would be the ultimate backstop uh, for these retail insurance companies to take pandemic insurance risk. After 9-11, so, yeah. um, there was obviously uh, uh, an issue about terrorism coverage. And the government stepped in and put together a program called TRIA, which was able to provide an ultimate backstop for terrorism coverage. And terrorism is excluded from Brian's policies and from my policies, if you read them. Um, but there is terrorism coverage available if you buy it. And for a period of time, Brian, after 9-11, a lot of people bought it very often after the TRIA program was established. And as time went on, fewer and fewer people are buying that coverage and taking advantage of it. Um, I'm a little more optimistic um, about what will happen after a vaccine um, and after some, and there will be competition back into the insurance market. I mean, as a whole, the, the, the insurers have lost, not just in entertainment, but totally with the pandemic, over $3 billion. Uh, and, um, but they are going to make up these losses. And over time, I think this will, you know, the, the business will find um, its level and there will be insurers who are willing to take uh, some risk. And I think there will be then others because there will be competition. I do think if the government steps in and provides a program, backstop program for insurers and reinsurers, we will see more product rates come down and the ability to access that. Um, but I do agree with Brian that in the next year, 18 months, as the vaccine does roll out, um, I don't see um, insurers all of a sudden removing these exclusions. Um, these are systemic exclusions. And if anything, unfortunately, I think we're going to see, the, the industry was so blindsided by this, even though the big insurance companies all modeled it, um, they weren't ready for it. And um, I do think, unfortunately, we're going to now see insurers um, on edge about other systemic uh, uh, perils that they're going to either try to cover or now are covering and are going to try to move away from. Specifically, I know, I specifically cyber. I think that's the next systemic peril that insurers are, are going to be concerned about. Maybe it, 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 with filmmakers, it has a different, you know, there's a different element when it, with respect to filmmakers. But I do think I agree with Brian, there isn't going to be any short-term change. We are going to continue to have to find ways around managing this risk. This hit, Fred, this hit the C-suites, right? And every major insurance yeah. company that writes entertainment insurance. Yes. Very concerned about one event, absolutely one event, and, they're, and, they, and they have a limit, a separate limit for each production that shot 
all over the world, right? And you've got literally 2,000 to 3,000 productions that are all shuttered because of one event. And they each carry anywhere from one to $5 million or more insurance on that one event that reinstates it again you know, after, after they lift the lockdown, right? So I think on that basis, I think, it, I think it's overly optimistic to think that, that when this one event, and you're right on the, on, the, on the cyber issue because they're concerned about what's called the aggregation of exposure due to one occurrence. Mm -hmm. California got earthquake, they worry about that. Um, but it's California, then, it's defined yeah. in a location. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got, and you've got, you know, you've got, uh, you know, you got hundreds of shows of whatever in the back lots of, of Los Angeles, right? And they always ask me those questions, like, King, what happens if, um, you know, there's an earthquake and all these productions? I've got all these limits in my aggregation of exposure is just too much. I can't afford that. And the next one is the the, the, the C suites um, in insurance companies. They are they're talking about the cyber event that could potentially shut down the infrastructure of 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 every, of, of every, um, you know, uh, computer system. Or power grid, or power grid. Including power grids all over the world that, that could be problems. Um, but, but getting back to our problem <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of COVID, uh, I think we're in agreement. There's no, there is not gonna be a short-term insurance or bond solution. You know, investors, especially the commercial lenders have gotten very, comfortable with the idea that if there was something in Brian's policies that was excluded or a claim that hadn't gotten paid in the independent business when you have a completion guarantee, the bond is an unqualified obligation to complete that movie that the bond would just cover. It. And uh, uh, other than, you know, terrorism or war, the very well-known, well-defined well, uh, exclusions. And now the bond's not going to cover, you know, a COVID pandemic. So commercial lenders, which are really focused on taking credit risk, not uh, pr not production risk, um, are are kind of left out in the cold because they have no place to turn. The bond is no longer just a blanket coverage for everything that might happen. You know, our obligation is to finish the movie. We can't if it's a COVID loss. That's something that's completely excluded now. Fred, you know, Fred, the, the sad thing about it is also that the streamers have plenty of money. They've got huge bank accounts. Their mm -hmm. their market caps in excess of a trillion, right? So you've got you've got all the streamers that got plenty of plenty of money. You've got the media conglomerates that again they're worth you know what four hundred billion, five hundred billion in some cases or more. So they have plenty of money to self-insure this. The sad part about this whole thing for me is that who does this really impact? And that is the independent producer that's got a brilliant project, something that's thought provoking, that has you know, a social statement or some, something that's really impactful to our society. And then, and then not being able to make it because Fred won't bond, I, because I can't insure and banks won't lend and so it's a hot potato for you know who takes the risk and so and i think it goes back to you know we should all share some of that risk somehow some way and yeah maybe we can get a little bit of COVID insurance would the bank be comfortable with a couple million opposed to you know 30 million on a 30 million dollar movie but those are the kind of conversations i think that um and we have had those with with certain banks and bond companies such as your company, Fred. And, and uh, that's the sad part to me because I think that the independent production has been, you know, the, the most impactful on our society throughout the last, you know, umpteen years. So um, anyway, that's my, my view. This has been fantastic. Let's, uh, unfortunately, we're gonna have to end things, but let's visit some final thoughts. Um, Cass? As a filmmaker, where do you see the road heading? Um, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I, I don't look at it very bleakly like a lot of people do. Um, stay in development, find creative ways. Like you said, the, the risk really is the production time. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in a writing room right now for a show and we're doing it over Zoom four hours a day. Um, so, you know, be hopeful as an independent filmmaker because there are things in the process that you can continue to do until more answers become available. And there's really not much you can do other than that, other than some of the things that we've already mentioned. And, and hopefully there will be a solution with the insurance, um, you know, inform yourself as much as you can, sit on as many panels as you can. So as a producer, you know how to move forward. Anthony? So great points, Kaz. I'll follow up by saying, you know, as I touched on earlier, build your network. I'm currently on the board of something called Series Fest, which is a, a great um, operation, annual festival that's for creatives to help get their name out there and their projects out there. One of the programs that we launched is the uh, Executive Elevation Mentorship Program, where it pairs uh, seasoned executives with creatives of color. So look into that. And I think it's a good opportunity as a follow-up for this conversation to kind of expand your network and, and kind of get some more contacts into other parts of the industry. Um, you know, the, to kind of add to my earlier comments around investor deck, I think with a vaccine, the risk reward profile will open up a little bit more. So a little bit more optimistic on that. I feel like capital is still flowing. Uh, we touched on some of these bigger, you know, major uh, uh, outfits that are now uh, making money still hand over fist. There's been somewhat of a disconnect because you have this massive pandemic with the market and some of these companies' stock prices have been going through the roof. So that shows you that they need content and they need your content, right? So look at an example of a Tiger King. So when you're putting your deck together, really dig into some of these AVOD, these, you know, different distribution channels, opportunities, you know, SVOD, all of that VOD kind of world. If you're new in the game, really get up to speed on that quickly because that is your opportunity, as Kaz mentioned earlier, is you have the ability to create content that they need and they want. And this has been, a, you know, because of the stay at home, Everybody is, you know, zooming like we're all on now, you know, all the subscription packages that all needs your content. So be encouraged with that because I'm going to leave you with a positive message, right? Is that you, there are opportunities. You just have to get creative. You got to get your hustlers mentality on. You got to get your, um, your investor hat on. Think like an investor. How do I pitch this? And then as Cass said, stay in creative mode as well because you are the product. Uh, Brian, final comments? Yeah, well, I'm also an optimist. And so let's, let's hope for a vaccine. Moderna, Phil, you know, and uh, Pfizer, they say that these, these uh, vaccines are 90, 95% uh, um, you know, um, you know, good, for, good for, you know, the, the future. And, and I, I do think that, that, that there is still a lot of capital in the insurance marketplace. And, and I do think that um, over time, the insurance marketplace will, will soften to some extent. Um, and yes, um, you know, make sure that you're surrounded by, you know, uh, a, a group of individuals that help, that can help you navigate through the, the insurance world. So get a good solid broker that you could, you can have a relationship with that, that you can check in with and uh, it can help you with managing the risks and doing the analytics. And um, so I do, I do think that, 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 um, you know, over time we're going to work through this. Um, I, I do think that the industry is extremely resourceful and it's just, uh, and I do see a path forward. So I, I, I am optimistic in, in six, eight, eight months, but the, the fog does have to clear and that, and that this pandemic needs to get behind us before, we can really see clarity. So um, those are my comments. And Fred, you have the final word. Well, I think, you know, the independent film industry is the most resilient group of, of people in the world. I mean, they are resourceful, as Brian said, they're resilient, they're industrious. Uh, people spend five years, 10 years working at making a film. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the industry wasn't defeated uh, by talkies, it wasn't defeated by television, uh, it wasn't defeated by changing tastes. Uh, they even put on the Oscars in the middle of, of World War II. Um, the business is gonna survive. There's a tremendous need for content. Uh, I totally agree with Anthony. All of these new platforms 
Uh, all these VOD, AVOD, TVOD platforms provide tremendous opportunity. Um, there's, you know, people want to be told stories. They want to hear from talented storytellers. So I'm very optimistic about the industry and I'm very optimistic about the independent film industry. These are the best storytellers in the world. Um, and I think they will, you know, we will find a way to survive. Everyone, you've been fabulous. You guys have certainly, you have certainly shared with us uh, some uh, great takeaways. Uh, so thank you. On behalf of the world's largest group of black film critics and the Alliance of Women Directors, enjoy your evening. Thanks, Thanks for watching. For